recently I traveled to uh, Switzerland and I flew Swiss Air. Uh, didn't have to take them. I came back through Swiss security, didn't have to take all my shoes. Um, and then on the plane, they served me with um, regular forks and knives, real forks and knives. Silverware. Silverware, real silverware. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's a very different standard. And yet we expect the world to conform to our standards. And it's just not the case, which is exactly what happened here. This guy wasn't picked up because the, we don't know if, if we would have caught him at our, in our airports, but we obviously would have a much better chance. Uh, and then the Times Square. So uh, again, this guy succeeded. He succeeded. He got to the venue with the weapon. It didn't go off because he screwed up, but he succeeded. Uh, Portland Street Light. This guy was, was, he would have succeeded also, except it was a sting. The FBI set up a sting with the guy, and, um, uh, but he wanted to park a truck outside of a religious ceremony in Portland and kill everybody who was at the tree line ceremony. Again, um, self radicalized inspired by an obstructor. Uh, San Francisco, Atlanta, Texas, wanted to put explosives in the bottom of a tower, a federal tower, take down federal assets. Again, inspired by an obstructor, local guy. Um, now, we're all focused on terrorism. But at a certain point in time as a society, do we really care how we die? Isn't, isn't a threat a threat, regardless of where it comes from? And I think we have a blind spot. This is our blind spot. February 14th, now this is, this is obviously after, uh, this is school shootings obviously, but this is, is after West Virginia. And the, the, this is obviously not working. Um, you just go through these, go through another one. Now these just happened. This just happened. So are we coordinating our security efforts to include school shootings? And that's what I'm going to talk about when we, when we get to the intelligence section. A lot of the same type of information, same type of precursor events, the pre-operational stuff, applies to both a school shooting and a terrorist attack. The difficulty with both is that, particularly if you have a, a self-radicalized individual, you don't know when the, flip, when the switch got flipped. And the same thing with someone who decides to do a school shooting. So we have to get much better at trying to meld in our mental health issues in our society with our law enforcement issues. Very, very difficult. Very, very tricky. All right. Uh, so, and this is the, uh, as I said beforehand, this was uh, Mumbai. You know, if you go through some of, the, some of the specifics of this attack, it was truly diabolical. One of the aspects that got me was that they went into the train station, firing to the air, not even shooting at people. So they would disperse all the passengers. And then they took IEDs and put them underneath the luggage. So that when first responders came or just to reopen the station and they lifted up the luggage, they would detonate them. What well, we're seeing more and more, I think we've seen in the Middle East for a while, uh, is the secondary attack. We wait, you get people into the, um, into the killing zone, you detonate one set of uh, explosives and then you wait for folks to come and rescue them. And that has a tremendous psychological impact. We saw that in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. That that would now, it's going to cause people to hesitate going into a scene. Yes? That was one of the specific incidents here in New York City uh, which happened that when we had the, uh, the Brooklyn individual, this is back in the Giuliani administration, uh, that set off a, uh, let's just say, a fire device in, in a subway, in the subway system on Lower Manhattan, right below uh, City Hall. And uh, it's one of the things that got the mayor of the city of New York energized to create an independent OEM here in the city. All right, because he was afraid of exactly what Mike was talking about, and that's that secondary device. All right, so, uh, you know, those words not only ring true in Mumbai, uh, but they ran true here in, these, in New York City as well. And the other thing, that the, last, the other aspect of this that was also diabolical was, you know, in, in, uh, in a military event, uh, in a firefight, the, one, the thing you want to do is you want to disperse the defenders. And you don't want to provide them with one target so they can apply force. So what they did in Mumbai was they took the improvised explosive devices and they, they went into a cab 
put a gun to the, to the head of the cab driver and said, just drive. And then he said, all right, stop here, let me out. And so they exit the cab, they leave an ID in the cab. And then the driver just goes off and randomly detonates someplace else. And that now takes the attention of the defenders and applies it to that area. That has nothing to do with this. Now, I just one, one quick uh, diversion. I had a uh, personal experience with how that type of misinformation can change the entire tempo of an operation. I was involved in a uh, state police shooting. It was one of the agencies I used to oversee in Morganville, New York. It was a, a police officer, a trooper got shot in a, in a traffic stop. The guy then took off with a van. They were searching for him. They thought he was in one particular area, but then they got a bizarre call that there had been a carjacking about 20 miles away. And so all the resource state police went to that scene. But in fact, the guy was still right around the corner from where the, sh the original shooting happened. And what happened was that they dispersed the resources and they went with a firefight at the farmhouse. But again, you know, it's this, it's so hard to determine what is going to happen during an operation, during an event. And that's what they, the bad guys, want to do. They want to disrupt the tempo of defense. chance if you really if you're interested in intelligence I would urge you to read George Orwell's 1984. Remember from high school? Um, I read it when I first took this job and I'm telling you it's so eerie as to where we're headed as a society. And it's the almost the same justifications. Society security. Uh, here is the intelligence cycle versus the um, people are upset when civil rights, particularly here in New York City, when civil rights raises their head and they say, you know, let's question what the police department has done. I appear on Fox News and I talk about the stop and frisk policy for the New York City Police Department, about their, their use of intelligence assets, and I defend them. But I also defend the need for a group like the ACLU to question what we're doing. You've got to have a full and fair debate as to what constitutes liberty, what constitutes protection, in my opinion. You just cannot give up and say, you know what, we're going to make everybody safe, or nobody's going to have any rights or liberties. It's just then we let the bad guys win. 
Um, so here's, here's the difference in the last two bullets between law enforcement and intelligence. And even 11 years afterwards, we have not still fixed that issue. And if you go and talk to some of the uh, leaders in the FBI, they'll tell you the FBI's mission is very different than the counterterrorism mission. And yet, Congress has foisted that upon them, said, you're the chief counterterrorism agency in the United States, while still maintaining your responsibility to go and investigate crimes, arrest individuals, and develop cases for their ultimate boss, the U.S. Attorney. So do, do two, uh, just a comparison. We could probably do side-by-side -side screens, but here's the first one. If you study intelligence, you know that the way it works is very orderly. You decide what you need to know. Then you go out, and that's a requirement. Now you say to your, your agencies, go collect. And by, by the way, as you know, there are 16 intelligence agencies in the United States that spend over $100 billion a year just in intelligence gathering. You then go, and when, you, when all sources, whether it's um, electronic, whether it's uh, personal, uh, you know, uh, uh, human-based assets, whether it's uh, wiretaps, you get all the information back, and then you do an analysis. And the analysis is based upon the requirements. And then you produce a product. And then you give it to decision makers, and then they decide what to do with it. And eventually, from the CIA perspective, that winds up in the President's daily briefing as to what they need to know. Law enforcement is reactive. Law enforcement event happens. Now you're going to have to go and collect against that event. You're going to have to investigate it. But again, you're always reactive. And there's no strategic analysis as to what you need to know. What do you need to know? The guy knocked over a, a liquor store. What gun did he have? Uh, were there any witnesses? Um, did anyone get injured? How much money was taken? Those are all reactive uh, and um, reactive analysis that you need to do. And of course, you, you build a case. So, go back for a second. The, the point is that the intelligence cycle and the law enforcement investigative cycle are very different. And yet we expect police officers at every level to be able to discern that, to make that differentiation. And the hardest thing about the counterterrorism mission, it is supposed to prevent an attack. Could you imagine if you said to the police department of your local, of your local town, prevent crime, every single crime? Well, say, yes, certainly there are strategies that have been employed very successfully in terms of preventing crime, but that's not really their mission. They can go after certain elements of crime, but they can't truly prevent crime. Can we truly prevent a terrorist event from happening? Go ahead. Um, so these are, uh, these are the, the problems that we have in the first bullet. We spend so much time going after the aspiration. We get so much time, you know, woulda, shoulda, coulda, and yet, if we don't, and an event happens, then it's gotcha. You should have picked up what was going on, and you didn't. Therefore, you're responsible. Good. Um, additional uh, uh, obstacles. There is way too much information. You know that. There's so much information out there. The old thing, if it's not a needle in a haystack, it's a needle in a haystack of needles. It's so incredibly true. And remember, as much as we think we have this robust intelligence community here domestically, we don't from the standpoint of developing actionable, real-time intelligence. You never get a product that says, okay, at 2 o'clock this afternoon, we're going to have people trying to do this. They're going to be going, but we don't get that. And yet we spend so much of our resources trying to chase that. What's the information out there? Day job, you know, crime, if that goes up, then you're, you're as a police department, you're seen as a failed mission. Um, it's not actionable or timely. And then there are institutional. These, these last uh, three bullets are about the, the practical day-to-day -day issues. I always saw the, uh, uh, the New York State Intelligence Center, the NICE. And I learned these lessons. New York City has a great intelligence network. And you know what? They spend a lot of time, money, and effort, and they're not sharing unless you can bring something to the table. They're not just there to, to, to socialize with. They've got too much at stake for what they're doing. So if you can provide something that they need, that you can develop a partnership. Short of that, if you're just another reporter or a repeater, 
the intelligence, you're not going to get the same type of the same type of level. And Greg Kelly jealously guards his operation because he's put so much time and effort in developing it. And yet, how can you expect surrounding counties or states to develop that same type of intelligence with that same type of intensity or resource commitment? And information is, in fact, power. And that's how you maintain your hold on the resources. Uh, public engagement. So, go to the last question. You know these programs. Do these really work? Can anyone tell me of a tip that came into the terrorism tip line that actually resulted in an arrest? Does anybody know of any instances? How about our, uh, our friend, the veteran, um, in Times Square, who was selling the um, uh, selling his wares by the street, and he had the tip that uh, closed the case on the Times Square guy. Right? Didn't he make the ID? He was the one who went and said, I see a car smoking. Yeah. He called 911. Okay. Not terrorism tip line. Uh, okay. uh, yes. Did the other word bomber's father contact uh, the local intelligence or the, I seem to remember he got involved somewhere in the intelligence cycle. I, mean, I don't think he called the terrorism tip line. I think he called it. An well, he would have been a foreign national, so whatever, yeah. My, my point is that I don't know of anything that came into the terrorism tip line and actually resulted in an arrest. Why does it matter? Because we engage the public. You get on a train, what do you hear? See something, say something. All the time, see something. We have put enormous resources into this. And yet we haven't seen that kind of return on investment. The question is, do we stop it? No? Yes? You see something, say something. Uh, I've seen it work. But it's not necessarily calling the terrorist tip line. It doesn't really matter if someone calls the terrorist tip line or 911. Do you have a specific instance in mind? Well, I know what happened in New Jersey. And if you didn't have a see something, say something campaign out there, would that have happened anyway? I don't know. See, I guess my, my question, there's no real answer to this. Because we, we have to do something to try to engage the public. I was a great advocate about this. Particularly following the days of 9-11, people felt like they were powerless. You have to give people an investment, a buy-in into the system itself. But I'm going to argue now that you can't just create a program and let it run. You have to reevaluate it. You have to evolve it. You have to do it in different ways. People understand that personal safety needs their involvement, but just to throw out the terrorist tip line. I mean, it was like it was like the whole th the thing at the at the airports, you know, where you know if you if you, know, if, you if somebody has given you something, you know, don't carry it on a plane. I mean, at some point, it's like putting your your seatbelt on. Here's how the buckle flips into the flap. I mean. You know, after a certain point in time, the public sits there and says, what do you think, we're stupid? And you get cynical. And they realize that people, all they're doing is just checking the box on security. And that erodes confidence that you have a proactive, evolutionary, <coughs> inspirational thinking that goes behind the billions of dollars we are applying to this threat. Obviously, it's an editorial comment. Um,